recording. Okay, good morning, Jeremy. How are you today? Hi, very good, Steve. How are you? All right, so I'm Steve Schneider. This is a the second episode of our podcast as part of the Design Right Studio for the spring 2017 season. Welcome, and welcome, Jeremy. Hi, hi, Steve. And today, we're going to continue or start our discussion on Vandendorp. And so Vandendorp... Um, his book that we're talking about is called From Papyrus to Hypertext, and today we're going to walk through, talk about the first four or so essays. We'll see how far we get. We've got about about 30 minutes here. Um, and then we will, um, and along the way we'll chat about how we built this commentary. Okay, so let's jump right in. Um, you know, in, in my reading of this book, and it's interesting to use that word reading. It seems to me he talks a lot about reading and not so much about writing. And, um, and I was wondering if you wanted to, to sort of jump in on that idea um, and you might bring in the notion here, um, my little blue text there. Um, you know, he talks about, he, he conflates this idea of browsing the web with reading a novel and then we get into this form and content. And so, I don't know if so that's enough to hook on. There's a few things that pop up here. What, what, one is a point we raised before that this book is 17 years old, and so mm -hmm. um, fair the enough. The idea of writing, hi hi. The idea of writing hypertext, I think, hadn't been as well developed by then. I know there were some pioneering tools that some people used, but it wasn't it wasn't commonly uh, it wasn't commonly done. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I I think uh, another factor is that he's very focused on um, he's answering some questions that I would never have raised so <laughs> for this very first paragraph talks about the fact that computing has an impact on the humanities and um, and that doesn't really need arguing to me it seems obvious that for computers once once we realize that they they basically um, uh, they can help us in any any area where human thought or communication is involved. It became clear that computers and software were going were going everywhere, um, and so I think that the focus on reading maybe um, also be part of that. That he's um, dealing with um, at the time a belief that people wouldn't read long passages of text as hypertext. Fair, okay, so, fair enough. So, uh, a, 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 a childish medium in its very in its infant infancy and wasn't taken seriously as literature. Right. So, in order to be taken seriously as literature, rather than as a tool that we use to make literature, then uh, you know you focus on the reading side, I guess, because literature, um, sadly, from some perspectives, must be defined by the fact that it is read rather than the fact that it is written. Is the fact that it's read that makes it literature surely not the fact that it's written right so the same idea about why the hypertext was immature again 1999 we have the benefit of 18 years or whatever it is seven i can't do the math 17 18 years since he wrote this and of course it's probably 20 years since he wrote it as opposed to when it was published yeah. and so hypertext is probably more mature and so okay that's a good point um what I did like about what he does, and that's that's in this this quote here, which I'll just um, open up again so that it's um, highlighted. Um, oh, I see. So I've yeah, I've got my comments. So I have to fix that so they don't yeah. both open at the same yeah. time. I think I know how to do that now. Um, is that I'm not sure I agree with this observation, but the um, you know, do you think that reading different kinds of texts, and I'm struggling with the with the right word. And I struggle with the word of books and prints to differentiate that from hypertext. But do you think that reading different kinds of texts that you it's fundamentally different? Like so he says a book is duration and continuity. Hypertext is marked by urgency, discontinuity, and constant choices. Does that resonate with you now too? I'm not sure I agree with that. Although clearly I do it because here I am, making choices and opening and closing things and and doing exactly as he said it was, and, and interrupting the duration and continuity of the That's reading. That's very interesting. I hadn't really, um, I hadn't really picked up on those words, um, but the language he uses there is very interesting. Um, 
it's certainly been part of my focus in working on hypertext through Tiddly Wiki was specifically about trying to reduce the discontinuity of mm -hmm. the hypertext experience. So I was specifically did feel that um, navigating Wikipedia, for instance, um, wa uh, was um, discontinuous because one would click on a link in those days, get a white screen for a while before eventually, you know, getting a full page refresh and having to reorient oneself as one as one moved around. And so Tinduiki's first origins was in trying to um, reduce that friction. But I think now. I think of that stuff as being kind of an implementation detail, <laughs> as yes. in something that will be continuously improved without us doing very much more than doing it, if you see what I mean. That's how um, it's through practice that such, um, uh, that such improvements get made, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, in, to say this in his first section, um, uh, saying that um, hypertext is punk rock and reading a book is a symphony is quite surprising yeah it's i just i, I was, it was it was intriguing to me and so um and similarly when he talked about how he his research and his writing of the book his deep thinking of the book he used a hypertext tool and then he abandoned as he said the associative logic which i just felt was I, I just wonder how, 20 years later, we can now use Tiddlywiki or hypertext to preserve that logic and accomplish the writer's desire that actually the essays be read in a sequential order. And I think we do that. I think the opportunity yeah. is there in Tiddlywiki. And so that's kind of exciting. So I guess we have matured. Um, last week, we talked about those two words that are there in yellow now in the middle of the screen. I hope that folks are seeing that, tabularity and spatializing. Um, and you were really intrigued by the spatializing term. Um, and so I, I kind of picked up on that and, and wanted to sort of get get more to that. Do you th when you write a hypertext? Oh, so I don't think spatializing is describes the mental processes we go through in writing hypertext reality hypertextually. I think of spatializing as being a property of the way that we write, um, uh, the way that we record information, that allows us to um, convert attributes of the text to map into spatial position. Um, and so often we think of that in the sort of artisanal way where people have lined up columns of text and he, the text obviously here covers that when they talk about the tabularity of newspapers. Um, but also the idea that you can visualize something that happened in time, um, you can visualize it through space. So um, spatializing a, um, a movie would be a matter of taking the script and laying it out horizontally and decorating it with whatever other metadata like um, thumbnails and so on made it easier to understand and navigate the script um, but text itself spatializes um, orality um, and I think that's one of that's why it's such a useful concept because not only can we apply it to the transformations that we see when we think about hypertext, but it, it applies, it, it's a way of looking historically as to how writing arose and how it's different from orality. And again, I'm forever grateful to the book for giving us the, giving me the vocabulary to talk about this stuff. Well, I'll revisit that because I really, I had it in my mind when I was writing, I was thinking about, so what do I think about when I write hypertextually? I. I create the opportunity to have a link, and to me, that's I could call that process spatializing. But you're, you're you've got it yeah, on a different they, they, way. They're not, I mean, these are not. Um, uh, they don't preclude one another. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, sure. But the, uh, the, the yeah, it is there. That yeah, it was me actually. I wrote time uh, time interchange space in the margin. You probably can't read that. Um, no, I, I love the fact that you've got to bring in the book because you, <laughs> that's good. Um, um, uh, but yes, so to, to me, um, I haven't finished the book yet. No, um, neither have I. This stuff about tabularity and spatializing really feels like the core insights, and those insights are you know, a way of thinking about what's going on, which is tabularity. 
um, and a, a spatialized thing is a way of thinking about um, the properties. Yeah, I, I think the next time, work. yeah, the next time we see that, I believe is in five, and I've not gotten to seriously read five yet. So I'm up to, I'm up, I'm through four. Um, when he talks about this, and we're doing a very hypertextual approach here to the Vandenberg book by opening little snippets and totally destroying his logic and continuity. So I think that's fun. Um, I just want to draw attention to me. You know, that does the question does computer. And I love the way he uses the term computer, and, and it, I just love these historical references. Does it radically change the situation? Um, yeah, but to me, he, I think writing on the computer is radical as well. And, um, and perhaps because Van der Dorp is so focused on reading, he, he doesn't talk about the radical transformation in the writing processes and and perhaps that well, will he does, he, does, he does use the words written culture here yeah um, yeah right which is just and so i keep i, I keep having to to make sure that i'm going to keep an eye out for this because it's not something i'd i'd picked up on and as we'll, we'll get to i think hopefully later in this session i i was delighted by the link he draws between writing and thinking and how improvements yes. in the way that we write have driven improvements in the way that we're able to think and I take that as very much a vote for the way that we collectively I think think about the hypertext writing process as being an externalization process of thought um, and you know, the intertwingledness of writing and thought could you if you could say that again because we just lost you you think about right it was wonderfully put the writing is the ex you had a great word in there the externalization of thought it wasn't the you've lost it yes now. writing is is, um, is the externalization of thought and in hypertext writing in particular you think is a different type of external hypertext writing is the externalization of thought so i think with, of thinking was maybe what i said Okay. Um, what a shame the technology should fail us at the critical level. At the critical, yeah, that's all right. So, um, SA2, it, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, so, oh, I, on, say, I hadn't really noticed the bias about reading. Mm -hmm. um, but then, look, you see, you're, you're undermining your critique. Yes. Again, the invention of writing. <laughs> well, and that's why I said, oh, well, look, he, he's, he's to writing now, so that's fine. Um, I think that what he talks about with a written text, readers can choose the time of reading, the speed. So he's trans, he's comparing writing written text to an oral text, if you can use the word text with that. And um, and I think that these statements are true both for books, which I don't really like that term books, but I don't have a I don't have a good word for non hypertextual writing yet. And he hasn't given us a he talks about a codex and a volume, you know, different terms but we don't have a word for all of that pre-hypertextual well, writing one of the nice things that i've learned from this is that the book is already um extremely non-linear yes. compared to the scroll and so in fact um we possibly should be using the scroll as our example of a of a strictly linear medium mm -hmm. and i guess that's not familiar to people maybe we have to use the podcast <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the sections on the scroll, and, and, and I don't remember the other word, the, but the, he had a better word for it than the scroll, the volumum, or, or I can't remember the word, but began with a V. Um, we'll have to go back to that. Um, this, I thought, was just as a bit of a side note, um, to suggest that, in my mind, to suggest that voices, he was making the point that in an oral culture, when you hear the voice, you're you're connected to the to the speaker in a way that when you read the word, you're not connected to the speaker. I think we've made some advances there in understanding that writing is socially marked. Um, I know in the intelligence community, they they believe that they can identify different authorship analysis of so some the same potential terrorist who wrote in this news group. And over here, from the phrasing of their words, they can say, "Oh, that's got to be the same person." That's an authorship analysis. So I'm not sure that the that that's the point that he's making is is as is is still current thinking. I think that we can identify writers. In a sense, your writing action leaves fingerprints, almost the same way that your voice print leaves. There's a writer print, 
Um, that's that's a pretty um, that's an aside, and here's another aside, um, which just a long time before teaching methods adapted to this revolution, and and here we are again. <laughs> it's a long time before my teaching methods adapted the revolution of hypertext, and um, there's a passage in the paragraph before, yes, um, uh, around the year 400, uh, um, starting with that phrase. Mm -hmm. um, which I really liked, this, uh, the observation that somebody was surprised to see somebody else um, reading with his eyes open. Ah, uh, yes, I remember that, that. yes. Um, so only the first thing. Um, and, um, uh, 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 yeah, and, and that's kind of interesting, the idea that reading had the stigil actions associated with it that we've learned to drop. And I think we're again in that situation now, and pagination would be my example of something that um, uh, is really rendered unnecessary by modern technology um, just uh, as uh, or in many situations if you're not printing things out or something I should say more, more clearly um, and so well here and um, it makes me wonder um, uh, what other sort of vestigial actions there might be that we do for these ritual reasons that we could actually drop. Well, I wonder if, if, if perhaps around the year 2020, the equivalent of Augustine will marvel at seeing people no longer read with their eyes alone, because now, especially on digital reading, you read with your fingers as well, because you have you can't just look at the book. And of course, you always had to flip the pages, so you used your hands, but now you really have to engage more of your body in reading, perhaps. That's a... Yes, that's interesting. Yeah. But, but he was saying that you read without your voice, and we'll, we're going to talk about vocalization. I think it comes up, so when we get there, we'll, we'll come back to this reading with your eyes alone. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, he certainly talks about writing being an intellectual revolution, which I'm, I'm, I love the concept of writing as technology. It doesn't have to be machines. Um, and my, my point, and so we'll just skip past that. My, my point here on text and context um, is there is no point. Um, I wonder where my note went. It didn't, it disappeared, so we'll come back to that. Um, uh, I did not mean to do that. Um, there's a problem with my issue. I, I think point, uh, I just wanted to draw attention to the difference between the text and the context here and keep that sort of front and center um, in people's minds. Um, this, this idea here about text um, and those two blue comments about hypertext is hold, hard to hold on to as smoke. I love the imagery and I wonder if, if He's talking about oral to writing in the traditional sense of writing. And now we're saying, well, wait a second, hypertext is flipping it around. Does hypertext introduce the possibility, does hypertext replace order and, and consistency with fluidity and chaos? And that's a, you know, and I don't know what the natural state of hypertext is. Um, and I have troubles with the, that language that there is such a thing as a natural state of hypertext or a natural state of a book. I think that's a writer decision. But um, I think the uh, it's very it's very interesting observation. I, I um, uh, sorry, yours not the one I was about to make. Yeah. But that um, uh, the hypertext can contain that same kind of complexity, but the promise is that by um, transmuting our, our thoughts into hypertext, we can tame that complexity. That is actually for the first time gives us a tool for taming the complexity. Complexity in our brains we can only really tame by you know, understanding things more deeply or forgetting things. It's, there's the, we, it's by externalizing these things and spatializing them um, that I think we stand a chance to cope with that complexity because it does suggest the possibility that a hypertext system that is designed to assist the thinking process um, uh, needs to uh, needs to be able to handle as much complexity as you find in a human brain. Yeah, it, it just it just gave me some um, some interesting ideas to, to think about there. Um, and, and then this this was um, I'd never thought of myself as a reader of a book as putting myself under the rule of the writer. Uh, yeah. 
and that's and I wonder if if readers of hypertext think of themselves differently in relationship to the writer than readers of printed texts. I, I've often be, be, I'm daydreamed about the tyranny of the writer uh -huh. and how much I resent it as a reader. And I think the hypertext fiction community would recognize that. But actually, could you scroll up one paragraph? Because um, uh, the paragraph that starts by making it possible to record the traces of a mental configuration and reorganize them at will, writing introduced a new order in the history of humanity. I love this entire paragraph. Let me make let me um, make a note of that, and I'll just use this as an opportunity to demonstrate a little bit of how I've been working. So yeah. I, I start here, um, and I'm going to need to. Okay, so yes, this is this is a quick diversion into Tiddlywiki world. Um, if you get the info, it will tell you the things, the tiddlers that are tagged by this tiddler. Okay, and so you wanted to focus on this paragraph, and so what I've been doing to create a note um, is I'll, I'll just I'll highlight this portion of it, which is enough to get us started. Um, and I use the excision tool, which is here. Oh, well, hang on, you stopped in the middle of a sentence. Ah, you don't maybe quite want to go there. Oh, okay. So, um, I think I think yeah, up to there is fine. Yeah. Oops. Um, I've been trying not to put the periods in. I'm not sure why. Yeah. <laughs> no, that seems quite sensible. Yeah. So this is called the excision, and I'm gonna. Um, this is the uh, a new order in the history of humanity and I, you do want to tag it and then I'm using a macro here called um, key thought and so that creates this a link to my tiddler on the left and on the right I'm going to see the green and what it's going to look like and here's where my note is going to go and so I can now open this and this is a little kludgy Cluxy to do, but it kind of works. I have to edit this tiddler, and then this I can create a comment here, um, you know, and say this is a um, yeah. And so if I keep, and because we're on the zoom view as the, the way that we're showing the tiddlers. And if you go to the control panel, preferences, or zoom in. And so now we've got it written and we've actually created the comment now. Um, so this is one of Jeremy's, that should show us that. Yeah, there we go. This is one of Jeremy's favorite thoughts we discussed in the podcast. So, so I've, uh, I, I, I uh, moved your thoughts off temporarily. Um, so how do you think the invention of hypertext um, enhances our ability to record the traces of a mental configuration? Because I, I think that's your, your, your argument, is right? Is that... So I think for many of us, we find that hypertext tools like TiddlyWiki allow us to mirror how we already have things structured in our heads mm -hmm. with the, the palette of mechanisms that we've got for organizing content as we might refer to it um, uh, so the the process becomes very very simple one is trying um, faced with a particular task one transfers what one knows one's thoughts into hypertext in the process one learns more about what one knows and learns more about the structure between the items and the, the, we get that, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I, I was struck by that idea and I, I like the idea too that you pulled a paragraph that I had skipped over. So thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it reiterates more what was in the previous two paragraphs to be fair. It's a more confident assertion of um, of what the previous two paragraphs, um, are, you know, clearly trying to trying to posit. Yeah, um, um, we are. I'm just going to keep moving us along. You've got, I've got a couple yeah, of yeah, yellow sure, words sure. here: um, codex and subvocalization. I do want to talk about subvocalization. I I wanted to um, 
wonder if you think of yourself as part of the caste responsible for preserving the secrets of hypertextual writing. <laughs> and does that, uh. it, it, so that was just sort of a, a, a bit of a joke there, but it was interesting that, that he talks about the, in the initial phases of writing, there was a special caste, only certain people could write, and it was a secret. And there is a sort of mystification of coding that only certain people can code. It's a secret. It's a secret power. And I'm, I, I'm, the, I'm the opposite. There. I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm a proselytizer trying absolutely, to break the right. secret to everybody. Yeah, um, and that was, yeah I, I knew you would say that, but I just wanted to... <laughs> but I, I, and I think that that's really important to do because partly of what we're doing in this class in, in my classes, in the studio, in and I think in the Tiddlywiki movement, and why we, 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 we have such a, a common mission is that um, people say, well, Tiddlywiki is too hard. You have to learn so much, and I say, yeah, but it that's what you need to do. It's the tools. We want to give you the tools, and as opposed to like Microsoft Word, where they hide the code and we just teach you a little bit how to use it. So I, 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 I think in a sense that. Perhaps the open source movement, like the classical Greeks, don't have a caste responsible for serving the secrets of hypertext. And so perhaps we're like them in that we want everyone to have these tools. So it's just a, yeah, it's an interesting thought to, to play well, with. Well, actually, I can, I, there's a fun argument I can throw in there, which is I'm, I'm obsessed with the idea that software developers um, absolutely do behave like a caste that have the secret of making digital things, digital tools and that they jealously guard that secret and that most of the things that most of us build do not enable anybody else to build anything else and I'm obsessed with the idea that generative tools are the highest calling for a programmer because they put into the hands of somebody else who wouldn't normally have that ability this prime, uh, pr uh, pr uh, desperately important ability to make digital tools, to make digital stuff to be master of your own digital world, in fact. Mm. Um, so, uh, and of course, at the time this book was written, most websites would have been written in HTML, again, very much by a slightly different cabal of people who knew HTML coding. And it's hard to imagine that any of the stuff that we feel about hypertext writing would occur in the mind of somebody, even an, you know, an industrious person writing hypertext in 1997 with you know, writing raw HTML files, you, I don't think you'd get any of any of these kinds of insights. Yeah, no, I, I, and and your work and the work of this whole community, I think, also continues this notion that Ted Nelson, I think, was one of the earliest to, to mention in the mid '60s. Is you know, computers are going to change your life now. You must learn how to use them. You, you, basically, you know, he was speaking to the hum, humanity scholars and the the ordinary folks and say, you know, it's not just for the scientists. It's not just for the engineers. So um, I, I just I, I love to see the fact that that Vandendorp as well kind of references that. Um, this idea of subvocalization. Um, so, I, I, as I understand it, I did a little bit of work on this. The notion is there's there's some who argue that when you read, you subvocalize or you vocalize. You, you and you might still stay in your mind, but there's there's words. There's a, a track, an oral track, and and Vandendorp is bringing together the oral tradition and the reading tradition, and say you know you still subvocalize. That's how we connect it. That raised a question for me. Do I is where's my level of subvocalization when I click on a button? Wow! And, and that I, I had no answer. It's just a question. A, t a techie answer would be that in a traditional hypertext environment, hovering if you were using a mouse over a link might give you an indication of what the link pointed to, and so maybe subvocalizing it in the sense of touching, subvocalizing is like touching or feeling the thing and the equivalent of feeling a thing would be to hover over it in order to see where it goes without following it. Well, but I think uh, but I, I think that's really linguistic sort of... Yeah, well, I, I think, think, think his point right. is that the um, that there's two senses involved in reading. There's sight and hearing. So you see and you hear. And, and he says when people learn, to the quote that you, that you talked about, about reading only with your eyes, here Vandendorp is saying, you know, that's not really right. Even if it looks like they're reading with their eyes, they're still sub-vocalizing. The words are still forming and they're still hearing them in their minds. So I get that. 
and I think I sub-vocalize, although if it's sort of like if you start thinking about the letters you type, you, you get crazy and it drives you insane. But I'm wondering if you sub-vocalize, like is there a, a the inner voice saying, press on that button, press on that button, like where, and what you've introduced a really fascinating concept is like, no, we've replaced hearing with the tactile. And so touching is tact, and so that's fascinating. I love that. I, 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 that's just a research question. I don't even know how to approach it. So we'll have to leave it there. Yeah, but I just wanted to raise that because I, I like the idea of um, there's a lot of questions that Van den Dorp raises, and, um, and luckily we have a few more weeks to consider them. So, yeah, excellent. Well, it's been fun so far. Yeah, well, what if we say next week we'll move on to about, we'll try to get through five through eight, something in that range. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jeremy, and I'll see you again next week. And you've frozen, so we're going to end without you saying goodbye. He froze at the oh, exact... Dear, oh, there he goes. He's back. Okay. Now you can oh. say goodbye, and we'll see you next week. I'm back. Take care now. So, see you next week. Okay. Bye, see you, Jeremy. Bye.